Where did intelligence come from? If evolution is true, your ancestors were non-thinking rocks that after years of rain somehow decided to become intelligent and eventually become you. They seem to forget that an intelligence cannot create an intelligence greater than itself. Even if it could, evolution can't explain the origin of intelligence without an infinite regress. At some point, the first intelligence would have had to create itself because the fact remains it takes intelligence to create intelligence in the first place. Obviously an intelligence was there before anything else and obviously that intelligence made humans intelligent from the beginning. So why haven't all these supposed scientists admitted that they're dealing solely in fantasy? I had to investigate. The term intelligence has several meanings. A quick glance at any online dictionary will show you that even the most trusted lexicons disagree on the number of definitions it has, as well as the specifics of each of those definitions. Even with this disagreement, most sources have at least one definition being a characteristic in an individual, and usually one being the individual with that characteristic. Wikipedia lists several definitions, including one which was devised by considering over 70 separate definitions for the word. In 1994, physiologist Richard J. Herrnstein and political scientist Charles Murray published The Bell Curve, arguing that human intelligence is a better predictor of a person's future success in life than an individual's parental socioeconomic status. This caused a stir, leading to a group of academic researchers and fields associated with intelligence testing to sign and release a public statement in the Wall Street Journal entitled Mainstream Science on Intelligence. The definition they presented was a very general mental capability that, among other things, involves the ability to reason, plan, solve problems, think abstractly, comprehend complex ideas, learn quickly, and learn from experience. It is not nearly book learning, a narrow academic skill, or test-taking smarts. Rather, it reflects a broader and deeper capability for comprehending our surroundings, catching on, making sense of things, or figuring out what to do. Even that definition is highly criticized, but it lists specific features that we expect in intelligence. Reasoning, planning, problem solving, abstract thinking, complex comprehension, quick learning, and learning from experience. The human quest for synthetic intelligence goes back to antiquity, typically associated with golem spells, reanimating the dead, and other magical manifestations. Mechanistic approaches like the abacus, the slide rule, the astrolabe, and even clocks focused on calculations to aid in pursuits like commerce and navigation. In 1694, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz completed the Step Reckoner, a calculating device which presented calculations as discrete digits like an odometer, the first digital display. It was also able to perform multiplication and division. As the Industrial Revolution began, new machinery required far more precise calculations for design and execution. A device was needed to eliminate human error in these calculations. In 1822, Charles Babbage presented a paper to the Royal Astronomical Society entitled Note on the Application of machinery to the computation of astronomical and mathematical tables. In that paper, he described a mechanical calculation machine which he called the difference engine. Not having the funds to build the entire machine himself, ten years later he and Joseph Clement were able to produce a smaller version as a proof of concept. Impressed with Babbage's work, Ada Lovelace aided Babbage in developing the successor to the difference engine. Though mechanical, this device had what we would recognize as a CPU in the form of what was called the mill and a rudimentary memory in what was called the store. With this, it was able to perform not only calculations, but sequences of calculations in what we would call a program. This device, dubbed the analytical engine, would be a general purpose calculating automaton for use in several industries. Throughout the years, Luigi Federico Menebrea, who would eventually become Prime Minister of Italy, had been taking notes at Babbage's lectures. Lovelace translated those notes and published Sketch of the Analytical Engine in 1842. Lovelace herself had developed its calculations toward weave designs for an automatic loom using punch cards, making Lovelace, essentially, the first computer programmer. The two also developed a method of printing calculations from the engine by impressing digits in plaster, the first printer. Babbage never did have the funds nor technology to produce a working model of any of his inventions, but from 1985 to 1991, Doran Swade, curator of the Science Museum in London, commissioned the construction of a working difference engine for the celebration of the 200th anniversary of Babbage's birth. This model worked perfectly, as did the printer he invented for it. All of these inventions so far, however, are solely mechanical. 
simply the result of gears and tumblers. The beginning of electronic computing came in the late 1800s when Herman Hollerith invented the first electronic tabulation machine for the 1890 U.S. Census. It allowed a user to place a pre-printed census card over the device and punch a needle through their selection into a minuscule vial of mercury completing an electrical circuit which then turns a gear one notch in a display to record the selection. This method was ten times faster than manual tabulation. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, this invention allowed the census to be completed in only two and a half years instead of the projected 13 years and millions under budget. Hall Earth would later repurpose the invention for accounting and founded a company that would eventually merge with a computing tabulating recording company in 1911. In 1924, that company would in turn be renamed International Business Machines, or IBM, which built the Harvard Mark I computer in 1944 based on Hall Earth's concepts taken even further. The key here was that a single impact Impulse caused a single turn in a gear. When the circuit was completed by the mercury, the mechanism was on. When the circuit was incomplete, the mechanism was off. The ability to switch electrical states was a progression from merely turning a gear, which allowed for the introduction of Boolean algebra to process information inside the circuit. I will go into detail on this shortly, but this was directly applicable to computing with switching circuits or relays, as it allowed for complex functions to be completed by using the corresponding on or off setting in a machine by means of a relay consisting of an input wire connected to a coil. When the control wire gets a signal, the coil generates an electrical field that closes a circuit, allowing electrons to flow from the input wire to the output wire. When it doesn't receive a signal, the output wire also gets no signal and the circuit is off. Relays like this with a maximum ability to flicker back and forth 50 times a second were the processors used in the Harvard Mark I to aid in calculations for the Manhattan Project. This machine was able to perform up to three simple additions or subtractions per second. The relay was improved upon by the triode vacuum tube, which could switch on and off thousands of times per second. The vacuum tube was improved upon in 1957 by the invention of the transistor by John Bardeen, Walter Bertain, and William Shockley. Putting aside the quantum mechanics involved, a transistor acts just like a switch, but instead of causing the circuit to open and close a gate, two electrodes are connected via a barrier that can conduct and resist electricity depending on whether it receives an impulse hence the name semiconductor. At the time, the transistor was capable of switching on and off over 10,000 times per second. In the decades since, transistors have become smaller and smaller as they have become more and more powerful. Current transistors can perform millions of operations per second in less than one two thousandths of the thickness of a sheet of paper, allowing for more computing power in a smaller space. This might seem like a lot of fuss over the ability to switch a circuit on or off, but as I stated before, this simple ability allowed for the application of Boolean algebra for digital computing. George Boole was an English mathematician, philosopher, and logician. In 1854, he published The Laws of Thought, which used algebra to express logical statements via binary numerals standing for true or false. In the years since Boole published The Laws of Thought, his concepts were developed by others and eventually dubbed Boolean algebra. The three fundamental operations in Boolean algebra are not and and or operations. These can be expressed electronically by use of what we call logic gates. In the case of a simple transistor, if the semiconductor receives a signal, then the transistor allows the current to pass. This is a simple true statement. When the semiconductor doesn't receive a signal, the transistor doesn't allow the current to pass. This is a false statement. With this simple toggling between on and off, or true or false, we can build more complex statements. For the operation not, we replace the output wire with a ground wire and place the output wire before the semiconductor. In this case, the output is always on unless the semiconductor gets a signal, in which case the current flows to ground. This can be expressed as, if the control is on or true, then the output is off or false. This is called a NOT gate. If we instead place two transistors on the circuit, one after the other, followed by an output wire, we now have a situation where the output is only on if both transistors are receiving an input. If either the first or second transistor doesn't receive an input, the output is off or false. This is called an AND gate. If instead of side by side, we place both transistors on two separate paths from the input that rejoin, we now have a path for the current that is on or true only if one or both of the transistors are on on and off or false when both of the transistors are off. 
This is an OR gate. Obviously, there are volumes of details we aren't addressing, but these are the three basic operations in Boolean algebra, and they are noted by the use of these three symbols. We can combine them with other functions to make even more complex statements. For example, we can take an OR gate and add an AND gate to separate forks from the same inputs. If we follow the AND gate with a NOT gate, the output is OFF or FALSE when both A and B are ON, rejoining the rest of the circuit at another AND gate. The result of this is that if input A or or B are on or true, then the output is on or true. If neither is on, then the output is off or false. If both of them are on, however, the output is also off or false. We express this total operation in our own language as either or but not both, or simply n or. This forms the path that electrons take while determining which specific pixel or function to activate. Knowing this, even without knowing every symbol used in a circuit board diagram, you may still have a grasp of what kind of logic is being expressed in these circuit board schematics where these basic operations are built upon each other to express much more complex statements and perform more complex operations. This is a representation of the material process of the flow of information. Incidentally, information itself had recently been functionally defined and quantified with the same Boolean logic by Claude Shannon in 1948, built upon evaluating information together based on the number of yes or no questions it resolved. I covered this in episode 95, Information. We translate on and off to true or false, but we can also translate it to one or zero, which immediately allows us to work with information by Shannon's definition as a language. Again, leaving out the specifics of coding, how bits and bytes are arranged, and the apportionment of CPU resources, this is how binary code is used at the very basic levels of every computer program you've ever used, every website you've ever used, every electronic device you've ever used. Through the use of individual pits and a plastic layer standing for on, true, or one, this is how music is encoded or memorized on a CD. During World War II, English mathematician, computer scientist, logician, cryptanalysis, philosopher, and theoretical biologist Alan Turing had spent his time working for the British government in cryptography. He had already made a name for himself academically throughout the 1930s by publishing his 1936 thesis on computable numbers with an application to the Entscheidungsproblem, which put to rest Hilbert and Ackerman's postulation of a single algorithm that could answer any question accurately accurately as a yes or a no. In his paper, he used a hypothetical machine known as a Turing machine that could make decisions on whether to write a 1 or a 0 on a tape based on an algorithm reading previously written binary sequences on the same tape. While the intent of the paper was to solve a mathematical dilemma called the Entscheidungsproblem, the Turing machine and its ability to potentially process any algorithm led to the paper being described as easily the most influential math paper in history. He refined these ideas in his 1938 paper, Systems of Logic based on ordinals. As a codebreaker for the British government, Turing invented a codebreaking machine called the Bomba, which allowed the Allies to crack the encryption of the German Enig machine. The efforts of codebreakers during World War II were said to have shortened the war by several years. The vast majority of Turing's work was classified by the British government, so none of it was public knowledge for many years afterward. Some of the work was only declassified in 2012, with no indication of what other work might still be classified. After World War II, Turing continued developing his ideas on computing, further refining his Turing machine, but shifting his focus toward making machines think more like human beings. In 1948, Turing created a computer chess game, but was unable to run it through a computer because there wasn't yet one powerful enough. Instead, that he played a game by making his own moves and then running the game through the chess algorithm on paper to determine the computer's moves and carrying them out on an actual chessboard. Every move of this game was recorded and required half an hour between turns. In April 15, 2017 issue of the Wall Street Journal, chess grandmaster Gary Kasparov stated that the computer algorithm played a recognizable game of chess. Turing published his essay, Computing Machinery and Intelligence, in the October 1950 issue of the journal Mind. Although the term artificial intelligence hadn't been coined yet, Turing's essay is, in essence, the founding work on the topic and introduced a method of determining intelligence called the Turing test. The Turing test is very simple. You need one person or subject behind a computer having a text conversation with two others, a computer and another person. The subject, unaware of which is which, conducts conversations with both the computer and the person as if they were real people. According to Turing, a computer can be said to be intelligent if it can't be distinguished from a real person. 
This test is used today for testing the quality of AI in a system. This also leads us to yet another definition for intelligence. A machine is said to have artificial intelligence if it can interpret data, potentially learn from the data, and use that knowledge to adapt and achieve specific goals. By this time, this pursuit had become associated with cybernetics. But at a workshop at Dartmouth College in 1956, John McCarthy introduced the term artificial intelligence, establishing it as a separate discipline. This technology is now affordable and fits in your hand, but the goal is for it to be indistinguishable from a human intelligence. In that vein, MIT computer scientist Joseph Weizenbaum presented ELISA in 1966, a simple computer program meant to impersonate a Rogerian therapist. This program eventually made its way to home computers where it reportedly fooled several people. In 19 in 1972, American psychiatrist Kenneth Colby, seeking to advance psychiatry and artificial intelligence by merging many of their essential concepts, released Perry. To test how well it emulated a real human being, Colby compiled several transcripts of conversations with either the program or a real person. Thirty-three psychiatrists were shown transcripts of the conversations and then asked to identify which of the patients were human and which were computers. The psychiatrists were only able to correctly identify human or computer 48% of the time. Several other programs like this, Alice, Jabberwocky, and Dude would emerge leading to the term chatterbot. Perhaps the ultimate Turing test is to see how these chatterbots fare with normal, everyday people. And as it turns out, AI fools us every day. Not just as a novelty, but enough for people to invest money and secrets. One example of this is Cyber Lover a malware chatterbot that first began making the rounds around 2007 by flirting with users, gaining their trust, and bilking them of their information and finances while doing the same to any contacts they may have. This, of course, highlights a weakness in the Turing test. It assumes that human beings are the pinnacle of intelligence. As neuroscientist Ace Pinach Saigon and computer engineer Ilya Sikekli noted in their 2002 paper, Pragmatics and Human Computer Conversation, human beings are prone to doing some rather unintelligent things. A among these unintelligent commonalities is being susceptible to insults. The human brain, however, does not contain logic gates. It contains neurons. Similar to the concepts of on or off or sure or false, a neuron is either firing or it is not firing electrons. Each neuron is connected to other neurons via synapses in an electrical circuit. They fire by means of what is known as a voltage-gated ion channel, which is useful to most cells as a method of regulating an internal ionic balance. A 2001 paper by a team led by David E. Clapham chronicles their mapping of four six transmembrane repeater segments responsible for the regulation of salt in animals. The team found that this same quadruple repeating set of six segments corresponded to the very same process in bacteria, indicating that electron transfer is ubiquitous across virtually all known life. Neurons also function with quite a bit of similarity to a switch in a circuit board. Illustrating this, we can form a decision-making system with only four neurons allowing for movement in an organism. We start with two neurons connected to two separate muscles. Each time a neuron fires, it causes its corresponding muscle to contract. Also, once a neuron is stimulated, it sends a repeating electrical impulse that constantly causes its respective muscle to flex. This essentially results in both muscles being constantly contracted. In this configuration, we have the ability to move a joint two separate directions with two separate muscles, but no method of coordinating their contractions so that one muscle doesn't inhibit the other. Neurons have the innate ability to link to other neurons. Knowing this, we can then connect the two neurons through inhibitory neurons which are stimulated by one neuron firing and in turn inhibiting the other one from firing. In this configuration, both muscles remain relaxed until a stimulus causes one of the neurons to send an additional signal to contract the muscle. This is a scaled down representation on how your muscles are stimulated. In 1984, scientists from the Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge mapped the entire brain of the worm Chynorhabditis elegans down to the individual synaptic connections. At the the 2014 Summit on Legal Innovation and Disruption, Timothy Busbis from OpenWorm revealed that he had linked this connectome to a virtual body in a computer system, resulting in a virtual organism that moved and reacted to stimuli without any special programming. In 2017, the OpenWorm team revealed that they had loaded the worm connectome into an actual physical robot where it began moving and reacting to stimuli in the real world. Whether or not there is a supernatural origin to intelligence, it is in fact a physical process. 
The ability to make a decision can and does appear in nature by chance. Even without a solid definition, it can be emulated through physical means to the point that can even fool experts. Whether or not humans ever create an intelligence greater than ourselves is a matter of time. Whether or not computers can currently do many things better than humans is a matter of fact. What we do know, however, is that as far as we can tell, Turing's test for intelligence has been satisfied by using material means. Whether in a circuit board or a brain, intelligence takes the form of the material path that real-world electrical impulses take through a physical circuit processing information as quantified and measured through verifiable means. It is not a mystical phenomenon. It is certainly mysterious, but still part of the physical world. It is another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.